Today we're getting into the nitty gritty. Okay, recording started. So please feel free, Ajahn Pamali, to begin. Okay, thank you, Venerable. And um, uh, we just carry on where we uh, left off yesterday. So we talk yesterday or the uh, last couple of days, we've been talking about the idea of dukkha of suffering in Buddhism. And of course, the flip side of dukkha is always sukha, sukha and dukkha, sukha meaning happiness. And so when we talk about suffering, we also talk almost automatically about uh, happiness at the same time. And so having talked about the problem, and I, I'm sure we can all, probably we can all agree that there is a problem. Yeah, life is uh, not always all that it's cracked up to be, and there are problems in life. But, and uh, so now we want to look at the why side of things. Why is there suffering? And uh, as I mentioned before, we had this story with Ajahn Shah, where Ajahn Shah says to Ajahn Ram, why? That's a really cryptic, uh, Cohen like uh, question from coming from Ajahn Shah. And uh, then he gives the answer himself. It's not like a cold question, but he gives the answer himself and says, There is nothing. And uh, there is nothing means that there is nothing inherent in human beings. Yeah? There's no essence, there's nothing that is there that can always um, kind of give a stability of existence that you can always fall back upon as the real you, as the real source of happiness, or anything like that. And, and in the absence of that, the absence of anything which is uh, stable, um, uh, permanent, if you like, and, uh, that you can fall back upon, in the absence of that, all we are left with is conditionality. Yeah? Conditions, causes, and things playing out, uh, and depending on your past and, and uh, all the conditions that actually work in your life. And so, um, um, uh, the, uh, what we're going to look at then is exactly how this conditionality plays out. Yeah? What are the causes and conditions for suffering, and how does it come about? Uh, and uh, this, of course, is, uh, becomes very interesting because if we can solve this particular issue, it means that we can solve the problem of existence itself, but the things that are problematic in this world. That is what I, I think I mentioned very briefly before, uh, is that the Buddha, you know, the, one of the reasons why the Buddha is so such an interesting teacher is that he talks about the things that are the very uh, at the very core of what it means to be a human being, yeah, the very kind of the, the most fundamental things that we are looking for in life, suffering and happiness. Uh, and it takes that uh, to the fullest depth of what you can find in terms of the highest happiness and uh, et cetera, et cetera, and the full solution to the problem of suffering. Yeah. And that solution is found in the very uh, famous teaching of the Buddha called the dependent origination, yeah, Paticca Samuppada. That is where we find this solution. And then the Buddha he starts off with talking about suffering, yeah. the problem, and then he takes it step and step backwards and going back to what you might call the root cause of the problem, yeah, one step back at the time. Yeah. That is what dependent origination is. Yeah. Or sometimes it does the opposite, it starts with a root problem, yeah. and then he builds it up from the root going through these uh, 11 factors of dependent origination, 11 links, 12 factors, I would say, and then um, uh, showing how suffering, yeah, death, all these problems emerge, excuse me, emerge from that basic problem, which is at the root of this whole sequence. So what I will do now is I will uh, uh, look at this sequence. I'm, I'm going to just read it out first of all, and then I will look look at the sequence uh, stage by stage, each factor one at a time. And I'm going to just put some slides up on the screen just to kind of keep you, help you to keep track of what is going on. And, uh, and then I'm going to talk about each of these steps. And I'm, I'm not going to go into great detail. This is the teaching where we can go into enormous amount of detail, but I, I expect to finish this uh, within the hour or, or so. So uh, this is the teaching. Yeah, This is uh, found in the uh, uh, Sanyuta Nikaya, these are the connected discourses of the Buddha. Uh, and this is the first sutta of the Sanyuta Nikaya, and it sets out the uh, dependent origination right there at the very beginning. 
So I'll just read it out for you, just so you don't have the, have the background there. And this is, again, uh, Sir Jantos translation. This is how he translates it. So uh, he said, ignorance is a condition for choices. Choices are a condition for consciousness. Consciousness is a condition for name and form. Name and form are conditions for six sense fields. The six sense fields are conditions for content. Contact is a condition for feeling. Feeling is a condition for craving. Craving is a condition for grasping. Grasping is a condition for continued existence. Continued existence is a condition for rebirth. Rebirth is a condition for old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress to come to be. That is how this entire mass of suffering originates. So uh, this then is a famous sequence of dependent origination. And uh, you can see here that the root cause of suffering is said to be ignorance. And this is a very important word in suttas. The Pali word is avijja. And uh, it means it means ignorance in a certain way because it re is referring to a lack of understanding of the world. And, yeah, so we are ignorant about the real nature of the world. And, but it's actually much more than that. It also implies the delusion, the wrong the wrong grasp or understanding of the world around us. So, and this is an important part of this idea of avijja. In other words, we are deluded. We have a misconception. We see things which aren't really there. And this is a very important aspect of this ignorance as well. So it is about, so the problem is, and it kind of makes sense, yeah? It just looking at it that way, the idea that if you are ignorant, and if you are deluded, then you are going to suffer as a consequence. There is an intuitive uh, sense, something intuitively sensible about that. Because we know that that is very often how it is in our ordinary lives. Yeah, if you are deluded about what to do, you're deluded about where to go, you're deluded about how to take your exam, whatever you are deluded about, it means you have a misunderstanding of what is going on. And because of that misunderstanding, you're going to make bad choices, you're going to do silly things, and you're going to end up suffering as a consequence. So it's kind of intuitive that delusion or ignorance must lead to suffering down the track. But uh, what is interesting with dependent origination is that this is actually uh, quite profound. Yeah, and it actually not, it's not a simple matter of delusion leading to suffering. There's a long series of links in between which expounds on this and shows this in far more detail. And one of the very significant factors in the sequence is that not only does delusion lead to suffering, but it leads to suffering via rebirth. Yeah, rebirth is one of the uh, core aspects here of dependent origination. Yeah, it leads to uh, suffering via rebirth. And the second thing which is important, which also is contained in the sequence, uh, it is via rebirth and without a reference to a self, without the reference to an abiding entity uh, inside of us. So, yeah, so this is kind of the a summary of dependent origination, how suffering comes out of delusion uh, uh, via rebirth, without a reference to a self. Yeah, these are kind of some of the core aspects of it. And when you read the suttas, you will see that the dependent origination is sometimes expressed in slightly different ways. The number of factors is always the same. Sometimes you may have uh, 12 factors, other times you may have 11, you may have 10 factors, and you may have nine factors. Sometimes you have six or seven factors, yeah. But the uh, essential aspects of dependent origination are always there. Yeah? The idea that you are coming from delusion yeah, is, is somehow expressed. The idea of rebirth is expressed. And then the, how it then leads to suffering. Yeah? Those core ideas are always there when dependent origination is spoken about in the students. So in fact, if it doesn't touch on those core ideas, then, then you can be quite sure that it's not really dependent origination. Then you're talking about something else. So. 
And the Buddha talks about many things, and sometimes people say, oh, this is dependent origination, this is, and all kind of arguments about what it is. And, but um, I think if you, um, uh, if you analyze or you look, read the suttas carefully, uh, you will see that this is what is called dependent origination in the suttas. Uh, so what I will do now, I will uh, start from the end, yeah, instead of starting from the beginning, starting doing things backwards. Uh, why, why not? Yeah, because now we have seen the forward movement, we're going to go back to the very beginning, and uh, sorry, we'll play the end instead. And the end, of course, is precisely what we have been talking about, suffering. Yeah. So we're going to start with suffering, yeah? and then we're going to ask the question, why is there suffering? Yeah? Yeah? And then we come to the next factor, we're going to ask, well, why is that? Yeah. So this is the why question all the time. And then moving back towards ignorance in this way. Yeah? And uh, while I do this, I'm going to share on the screen with you uh, some simple slides uh, so that you can actually follow what I am talking about. Uh, that's kind of the idea here. Oops, that, that, it was the, that was the wrong thing to do. So, uh, so now, okay. So can you all see that? I hope you can all see that. So this is uh, the very last uh, factor in dependent origination. Yeah. So we are, we, we have uh, old age and death, but we have all the consequences of that sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and all of these kinds of things. Uh, and then we have the entire mass of suffering originates in this way here. Yeah. And um, it, it's kind of interesting, even this idea, this expression, the entire mass of suffering, you may wonder exactly what is uh, you know what do you mean entire mass it doesn't sound that bad yeah it's just a, we're living our ordinary lives how can this be an entire mass of suffering yeah, it's like a mountain a heap of suffering out there but the idea here is to remember that um, we are already talking about re rebirth here yeah the buddha probably when he formulated the idea of dependent origination the idea he already had understood the idea of rebirth, he already had recalled his past lives, yeah? This is what he's supposed to have done on his at night of awakening. So that was already part of his outlook, how he understood the world. And so when we're talking about the entire mass of suffering here, we're not just talking about the suffering right here and right now and of this life of the old age and dying. What we're talking about is this whole sansaric movement, yeah? This idea of carrying on into the future dying and then re-arising again, getting reborn, and then going on and on and on. That is why it is called the entire mass of suffering. Um, yeah, it is so kind of inconceivably large in a sense. So then in the suttas, the Buddha then asks the very famous question, well, I am afflicted by all of these kind of things. What might be the condition what might be the cause yeah for this problem what how do i how do i deal with this well first of all i should make the point here that the word condition here i am not sure if i'm entirely happy with the word condition it's actually very difficult to translate this accurately but the point here is that you're looking for the thing that is it's required for there to be death required for there to be suffering yeah Without that thing, there wouldn't be suffering. Yet. So what is the cause, if you like, for uh, old age and death, for suffering in the world? Yet? And um, you might think, well, if you reflect on that, if you ask the person on the street, yeah, what is the cause of suffering in life? And they might give you many, quite many answers. They might say, oh, the cause is that, you know, uh, we are not wise enough. The cause is that we, you know, we, we have desires when we shouldn't have, or we have to die, or people die around us, or the wars and the violence in the world. And it might give you a large number of reasons why there is suffering. And uh, you will notice that all of those reasons that people give in ordinary life, they are like immediate reasons. Uh, there are reasons that we potentially, at least, could do something about. Yeah, we can say, okay, we're going to resolve this by resolving this uh, cause for the suffering in the world. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do all the time. Yeah, that's what politics is about. That is what ordinary life is about. Uh, resolving the problems to make life more easy, to reduce the problems and have more happiness and comfort in the world. Uh. But um, the Buddha has a very different 
way of thinking about this, uh, yeah? Instead of thinking about kind of individual problems or things that are tangible, uh, it comes up with something that is really quite astonishing, yeah? And that is that rebirth is the condition for old age and death. Uh. If you think about it, it is really, you know, we are so used to it, if you are a Buddhist, that the idea of birth or rebirth is the cause of suffering. And this is what we hear all the time. And it kind of makes sense in one level. Yeah, of course, rebirth is the cause of death. Yeah, if you're not reborn and you can't die. So, of course, that is true. But it's also kind of strange. Yeah, it is kind of radical because it's not how we often think about causality. It is not a tangible thing that you can grasp and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to resolve the idea of rebirth. It's very kind of, um, uh, it's something that might be true, but it's not really useful, most people would say, to know that birth is the cause for death, because, okay, what, what can we do with birth anyway? Nothing. Yeah. And this is, so this is why the uh, Buddha is so special, because he thinks about the world in an entirely new way. He, the way he reflects on the idea of suffering is so much more profound than how we normally think about these things, uh, yeah? And uh, so he, instead of looking at kind of ordinary causes, he looks at the root problem, <coughs> excuse me, of this entire thing. Yeah? And um, once you recognize that birth is the cause for uh, old age and death and for all the suffering in life, uh, then you realize that uh, uh, once you, once you, are in this have been born, there's no way out anymore. Yeah, you already made a big mistake. The mistake was actually getting born. That was the problem. The problem isn't how you live your life now. Okay, you can live your life well now to stop things for the future. That is about the future life. In this life, you're pretty much stuck. Yeah, in this life, you can't do very much about this. So this is one of those things. Once you are reborn, once you have that birth, then then the problem has already arisen. And you can't really get out of it. You are in this mess, uh, and there's really no way of getting out of it, uh, except maybe at the end of your life. Uh. So it's a radical new way of uh, thinking about things. It's a way of thinking about uh, uh, a life and thinking about suffering, uh, which is just uh, not the way people normally would think about these things. Uh. And uh, for that reason, it's actually quite, uh, it's quite interesting. Once you're born, the problem is there, and there's no way to get out of it anymore. So it shows you, yeah, and of course, the, the, the solution then must be, the only solution then would be to end rebirth. That's kind of the corollary of this, yeah? If rebirth causes all that death, well, we must try to end rebirth. Uh, so the question then arises, well, how do we do that? Uh, and um, uh, uh, the answer that the Buddha comes up with, uh, yeah, and you saw the sequence before, and you, uh, if this is the first time you see the sequence, I'm not sure if it is, uh, uh, you may have been a bit baffled because it is kind of a strange sequence, this uh, a sequence of dependent origination. Uh, so the question then is, well, why do we get re reborn? Uh, and the Buddha's answer is the following. Uh, continued existence uh, is the condition for rebirth. Uh, Bhava Pachaya Jati. Yeah, and this too is kind of a slightly baffling, isn't it? A continued existence is the condition for rebirth. Um, and what it must mean, obviously, is that you must exist in the past life for there to be rebirth in the present life. Without that existence in the past, there couldn't be rebirth in this life. But there must be something more to it than that, yeah, because even an arahant exists, but an arahant kind of stops when it dies. There must be more to this idea of existence than just the very fact of existence. So what this is uh, referring to existence here is more a kind of existence, yeah, what kind of existence we have. Uh, is the more the mental, the psychological aspect of existence, uh, the feeling of existence, rather than the actual fact of existence. Uh, that is what Baba means in this particular case. So how can we think about this in a way that kind of makes sense for us? So, and uh, for example, if you want to investigate, well, what is your kind of personal existence in this life? Yeah, well, how, do you, how do you relate to this particular idea? How do you exist right now? 
And the, the way to approach that is to see where your mind tends to incline. What does your mind incline towards? Does your mind incline towards uh, uh, you know, thinking about the problems of the world, towards of the world? Is that what your mind inclines toward, uh, towards? Uh, does your mind incline towards uh, uh, the peace of meditation, uh, whereby you just want to uh, relax and you're always kind of dreaming and fantasizing about meditation? Uh, that would be great, wouldn't it, if you always fantasize about meditation? Of course, some people would do that if they are really keen on the Buddhist path. Uh, what do, where does your mind incline? Uh, and a good time to know where your mind inclines is when you meditate yeah when you meditate you can see whether your mind easily goes to the breath whether your mind naturally goes towards the peace and the enjoyment of that peace or whether your mind tends to proliferate you have to think about the worldly things to think about the problems you have to solve to think about the entertainments that you're going to uh, enjoy the, the food you're going to eat when you are off the eight precepts or, or whatever else it is you can understand that especially when you are on a retreat because then the uh, all the uh, ordinary disturbances that tend to fall away and you are left with really that core inclination of the mind you know, the core inclination what what where you naturally tend to lean towards so uh, this is how you can have some idea of what your uh, existence is, is right here now this is your mental existence yeah where you hang out where your mind inclined towards it uh, inclines toward what your mind is interested in uh, what is the direction that you are kind of heading in yeah what you are what you're holding on to right here in this particular life uh, and then uh, you will notice that of course if you are the kind of person who tends to think about all the world the things about your job about your family about whatever it is about the enjoyments in the world uh, then that that is sensory existence. Yeah, it is what is called karma bhava in the suttas, uh, the existence in the sensory realm. Uh, the realm that has to do with sense pleasures and all of this. Uh, so you can know when you see your mind inclines towards that, uh, that you are, in a sense, uh, living in that realm. You exist in that realm in a psychological way. Uh, yeah? Or if you find that you actually you, you are really enjoy your meditation, your mind inclines towards the peace, yeah, and you enjoy that, and it's actually something that you are almost leaping towards as you meditate. Well, if that is the case, then you are already climbing the hierarchy. There may still be some uh, sensory existence left there, uh, but there's also a movement of the mind towards higher states of mind. It's like you are, it's almost as if you are going up the various uh, heavenly realms, yeah, going to higher heavenly realms. Uh, and uh, the mind is becoming more and more peaceful until eventually, if you go towards the very, the mind really leaps towards samadhi and deep meditation. Well, then, of course, you have the what is called the rupa bhava, the rupa existence, existence uh, which has to do with the samadhi states. Uh, yeah? And if you attain those states easily, uh, it means that your mind is inclining towards that. Uh, you exist in that realm, uh, and that realm has become part, basically, of who you are as a person. Now, that is what you're interested in. That is what you're looking out for. Uh. So this is the, uh, our in internal existence. And that the biggest one of these existences is obviously the sensory realm. Uh. So one thing is the fact that your mind is uh, uh, interested in the sensory world, but the interest in the sensory world can take an enormous amount of different forms of, yeah you can be interested in the sensory world in a very bright and very um, refined way which would then uh, be, be equivalent to a very high kind of rebirth or you can be interested in the sensory realm in a more dark way yeah? where your mind is kind of lacking in energy and brightness uh, it's kind of gray and dark inside of you uh, and that is if you make a lot of bad karma that is what happens you make a lot of good karma and you are more part of the bright sensory existence and that mind state, yeah, that you die when you are coming to the end of your life, yeah, and then that inclination of your mind that you have already now is already existing in you now. You, whatever, uh, however you have developed that during this life, uh, that inclination you have when you are about to pass away, that is where your mind goes. Uh, yeah, that is how you then take rebirth because the mind is inclining towards that state right here, right now. And so the rebirth follows according uh, to that. Uh, 
it's kind of obvious, yeah, it's quite kind of obvious. Your, your mental state is in a certain way, and because obviously it is the mind that takes rebirth, then the mind, which has a certain inclination, will incline towards a corresponding rebirth as the existence that you have now psychologically in your mind. Yeah, and your mental state determines how you get reborn afterwards. And that is really the idea of karma. Yeah, the idea that your uh, your the quality of your mind determines where you go afterwards. So, so this is the if you like the connection between existence in one life and then uh, the rebirth that we have. And of course the uh, uh, the so the, the the answer here, if you want to end rebirth altogether, if that is actually what you are striving for, then you cannot exist at all. Psychologically, there's nothing that your mind leaps towards. Your mind doesn't leap towards the sensory realm. It doesn't leap toward the jhana realm even. It doesn't leap towards anything. It leaps towards cessation, the ending of things. That is what your mind is heading towards. Your mind is interested in only one thing, and that is the ending of things. And that is why when you come to the end of your life, because your mind is not leaning towards anything, it is not heading, it's not looking for somewhere to hang out afterwards, then there cannot be any rebirth because it requires the mind to be inclined towards something for rebirth to happen. If there's no inclination of the mind, things just come to a stop right there. And that is the end of rebirth. It's kind of cool, isn't it? And it's kind of, um, it sort of makes sense. It may not uh, make sense in a kind of scientific way, but if you think about it, it's sort of natural that the inclining of the mind is what drives this process. Yeah, It's kind of the mind is looking for something in the future, and when it doesn't look for anything in the future, it doesn't incline for that, then the rebirth process must come to an end as a consequence. But um, so that is Bhava Pachaya Jati, yeah? continued existence or exists is the condition for rebirth. So then the Buddha asked the question, well, what is the condition for continued existence? This is the next one. So let's see what the Buddha has to say. So, so now, very exciting. What is the condition? Click. Grasping is the condition for continued existence. He has here is a condition for continued existence, but it is really the big one, the one that matters. Yeah, it is the one that um, makes sure that continued existence happens. It's, that is true of every link here. Every link is a kind of a critical link that matters uh, for the next, um, for what follows on uh, to happen. Uh, so grasping is the condition. So what does grasping mean in? Uh, what is this in Pali? Uh, the Pali word is upadana, and uh, the word upadana means something like uh, take, up, yeah, uptake, you grasp something, you uptake, you hold on to your glasses, oh, uptake of the glasses. Uh, and uh, if you get really attached to your glasses and you cling to your glasses, you hold on to grasp them. No, don't go away, glasses. Uh, and you, of course, you get a little bit uh, attached to your glasses because without them, you are kind of. Uh, you can't really see very much when you get to my age, so it's kind of handy to have glasses around there. But uh, uh, so you, you hold on to them a little bit with, with a kind of, with a, in a sensible way. That's basically what it means to pick things up and take them up. Upadana, uptake. And this uptake is both literal in the sense of actually picking things up and grasping them, but it's also metaphorical uptake in the sense of all the things that we take up mentally in this world, yeah? The picking up of ideas, uh, the picking up of mental content, yeah? Of things that are inside of us. So it, it has a, it, there's more than just the, uh, it's both the literal and also the metaphorical meaning of uh, picking up is meant here in this particular case. Uh, so when we grasp onto things, uh, then we have continued existence. Why, how does this work? And uh, the way that, uh, and the suttas usually define grasping. They said there's four kinds of grasping. There is calm, upadana. Upadana is grasping. Yes, yeah, so the, the uh, grasping in the sensory realm. There is a uh, dit upadana. Dit is views. So there is a, a, the grasping or the taking up of views. Yeah, I'm sure we, we all know what that means. Everyone has views and opinions 
And usually lots of that. And there is the atta, uh, atta vad upadana, which is the grasping to uh, ideas of itself. Yeah, like all of us, you, I, I'm sure every one of you has an idea of, of yourself. You have a feeling for your identity, who you are, who you, where you were born, what kind of family background you have, your education, your gender, blah, 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 all of these kind of things, yeah? So we grasp onto that. And uh, the last one is silapat upadana, which is the grasping of precepts and observances. So these are the four areas the Buddha talks about. So let's start with the most basic one. The most basic one is probably kam upadana, grasping in the sensory realm. Yeah? And this is probably, the, this is by far the biggest one. Yeah? This is a really massive kind of uptake. So what exactly does it mean? What it means is that in our life, we do a number of things. We take up a number of things so that we can enjoy our sensory existence. Yeah? The kind of things that we take up, number one, the most important one probably is relationships. Yeah? This is such a big thing in the world. If you're not a monastic, almost everyone in the world is looking for a relationship. Might be some exceptions, but generally speaking, this is what people are looking for in the world. It's a very important input in this realm of sensory experience. It is about enjoying life, obviously. It is about having a partner that you can enjoy with. There's a sense of security. There's a sense of friendship, sense of, uh, seeking pleasure. All of these things kind of tie into one thing, yeah, which was a very, very big one. And that is what it means to take up. And of course, once you take that up, once you get into a relationship, your life starts to revolve around that relationship. You think about your partner. You obsess sometimes about your partner. You wonder what they are doing. You wonder how you should, what you should do, do together, all of these kind of things. Yeah? So you grasp that relationship, and then based on that grasping, your content of your mind is affected by that. Yeah? And then when you go on retreat, you think about your partner, yeah? You think, oh, I wonder what they're doing. Oh, oh shut up, don't this I'll read. Forget about that, yeah? And then, oops, and two minutes later, again, you're thinking about your partner in your mind, yeah? This is how sticky it is. And that means that you are existing in that way. You have grasped the partnership, and now you are stuck in that. You have to think about it. You are existing in that. So this is a classic one. Another classic one would be having a house, yeah, you have a home where you like to hang out. Why do we have a house? Well, because it is just incredibly conducive to living well. Yeah, it's a place of safety. It's a place where you have a nice bed. It's a place where you make your food. It's a place where you have entertainment. It's a place where you shelter from the weather and the storms outside. And yeah, you get away from the burglars if you have a good lock on your front door or whatever it is. Yeah, so again, you have a house. And then you, of course, you, and that's where you have all your possessions and everything in there. Yeah. And once you have a house, well, then you worry about that house. Yeah, you think about it. You, you are concerned that no one kind of steals what is there or whatever else it is, that it doesn't burn down or, or whatever. So your life forms around that house, and that home. That, uh, and then it goes on. Yeah, then you have your job. You have the rest of your family members. You have the kind of entertainment that you like to, to enjoy in, in life. Yeah, all of these kind of things. And you can see that for most people in this world, the whole world is shaped around these things. And then when they're trying to sit down to be peaceful, they think about these things. They think about it because this is what matters to them. This is what they have grasped. They have grasped it because it satisfies them in a certain way. And your world revolves around that. Your world is uh, moving towards the sensory realm. You are inclining towards that sensory realm. Yeah, so it's kind of uh, logical when you think about it like that. Uh, um, then you have the other uh, uh, upadanas, the other graspings. One of the interesting here is the sila bhat upadana, the uh, precepts and observances. Uh, yeah, uh, and um, that means that there are certain things that we do in our life uh, that we because we think that they are good for us. Uh, yeah, and because we think they are good for us. Uh, we kind of grasp onto those things. So sila is a classic example. Yeah, the sila here 
actually refers to sila in the ordinary sense. It refers to modality, the five precepts, the eight precepts, the 10 precepts, the 227 precepts, or any other kind of sila you might, uh, uh, you might be following. Uh, and um, so we grasp onto this to some extent, yeah? So we grasp onto that sila to be able to, hopefully that will be a condition for something positive. Uh, that also becomes part of our existence. Yeah. So you may not think so much about it, or maybe you will think about it. If you really grasp your seal, actually, probably occasionally you will think about it. You wonder how you can purify it more. You wonder how you can take it further. So that, that too, the part of where your mind kind of hangs out, yeah, reflecting on these things, so how to take it further. And that shows you that there are certain things that actually should be grasped. Yeah. So here we're talking about a grasping which uh, leads to a more refined existence, a more refined continued existence. Uh, yeah, we we're talking about yesterday about whether certain cravings are good, uh, whether certain graspings are good. Uh, and here you can see that these graspings that come in a wide variety of different kinds. Uh, and so our job is then to grasp all the things that are useful for us. Uh, and let go of those things that are problematic. Yeah. And uh, then we, down the track, we then let go of the more refined graspings as well. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so this doesn't necessarily mean that these things are just entirely bad, uh, but that they are bad in the big picture of things, but in the intermediate picture, you may have to grasp, uh, actually do some of these graspings. So we grasp the sea line, we grasp the morality yeah, in life. Uh, and ultimately, down the track, we let go of that. But in the meantime, we hold on to that. Uh, another example might be meditation practice. Yeah, meditation practice is a kind of behavior that we do. It's a bhatta, yeah, sila bhatta paramasa, or sila bhatta upadana. And, uh, and that can become like a behavior. It can become almost like a ritual that we do. Huh? We sit down twice a day, morning and evening, and we do our meditation practice. Yeah? And great, that's another very positive form of grasping. It is something which is very useful. And then there comes a point when this too becomes part of your existence, where you actually think about meditation, where your mind inclines towards that. You cannot wait to get back home and just sit down and close eyes and enjoy the meditation practice. Yeah, That time also comes down the track. Yeah? So uh, this also then forms your existence. Yeah, It forms it in a certain way. Yeah? But um, and one of the... Um, Kind of interesting points here is that uh, sila and bhatta uh, upadana when we grasp onto these things uh, we have to be wise about how we grasp onto these things uh, yeah it is very sometimes we can become like uh, uh, people who keep the precepts habitually which is which is fine uh, but uh, it is very important that we actually don't just hold on to them and do it habitually, but that we always investigate these precepts. Can we take it further? Yeah? How can we purify ourselves even more? Yeah? What are the things that are blocking me from becoming even more peaceful and more uh, bright in the mind so as to enable my meditation to happen? Yeah? Don't just practice sila as a robot, okay, because after a while, five precepts is quite natural, yeah, after a while, it becomes second nature to keep the five precepts, ask yourself, what more can you do, always investigate, don't allow these things to uh, kind of regress into becoming just habits or behaviors that you do, but always investigate the path so that you can go forward, if you do that, then you're going to be on the right track, yeah. The same thing is true for meditation practice. Yeah, with meditation practice, it can, after a while, it's like, okay, it's time to meditate. So you sit down and you kind of nod away and you don't really get anywhere. And um, for some people, that's what they do. That's their meditation is just sitting there, not really making any progress and not uh, getting the real benefit out of meditation practice. So, so there too, it should be more than just a behavior issue. Be something that we investigate, something we always ask. Well, where, what is the blockage? How can I take it deeper? How can I kind of move forward on this path? So we have to be careful here that these things don't become, we don't grasp them in a way that they are stale and they just become a grasp thing, but we grasp them in a more dynamic way. So we're always moving forward on the path. Yeah, so that the existence is always changing. Our idea of who we are as people 
is always changing because our grasping is always changing. We're looking at these things with new eyes all the time. Um, so this, so, so and then we have the, the last two upadanas, uh, the Atavada Upadana, which is the uh, ideas of a self. Yes, this has to do with our sense of identity. Uh, yeah, who we take ourselves to be. Uh, and you will all have some idea of that, yeah? Um, I, I'm sitting here, I am Buddhist monk. Yeah? That's my identity, I suppose, yeah? And uh, I, um, what, what else? I can, you know, all of these things that kind of come together, that sort of make me up. Yeah, when people see me, they think, okay, this is this kind of person, yeah? And then uh, this can be a problem, yeah? And uh, we, because sometimes when you have an, an identity, you will think about that identity also in meditation practice. One of the suttas in the Anjutra Nikaya makes precisely this point. It says that as your defilements go down, some of the most defilements we have in the mind are defilements that have to do with uh, um, uh, your family background, uh, have to do with uh, your reputation, the country that you come from, all of these kind of things. Yeah? And these, that uh, attachment to those things, the holding on to those things, the upadana of those things, the grasping onto that, uh, then uh, blocks us uh, from being able to make that go, yeah? Because our existence, our continued existence uh, depends on that. And we think about it, grasping into the thinking about these things. Uh. And I'm sure you know that that has happened, yeah? And it can happen when someone uh, says something to you which you don't like, yeah? They, they make you feel bad about yourself. Uh, and then you will defend yourself. What you are defending is your ego, your integrity, the, you know, the, the feeling of who you are in your own eyes. That is the self right there, making a re resisting other people treating you in the wrong way and putting you down or whatever it might be. Yeah, so we, uh, we, we reinforce the sense of self. It becomes one of the problems in meditation practice. And for that reason, it is important to let go of some of all of that silly identity we have in this world. Uh, yeah, abandon that, not hold on to these things so much. Uh, you know, and you know, sometimes I try to think of myself and I try to sort of see myself as just a just another being in this world. Uh, yeah, my identity as a person, my gender, or whether I'm a monastic or not, or my nationality or educational background, it's just all empty stuff. Uh, it's all in the past. It's got nothing to do with who I am now. Why should I hold on to that past? Yeah, it just limits me as a person. It just narrows me down in a sense, and it stops me from being able to have kind of this universal compassion and care for everyone because I focus on certain things, maybe as more important than whatever. So uh, letting go of all of this uh, silliness that we develop in this world, I think is a very, uh, very important part of this. And then when you meditate, uh, your mind becomes peaceful uh, and it allows you a very different feeling inside it. Uh, yeah, the feeling inside is that it's one of emptiness, uh, one of freedom from all of these kind of thoughts. And that emptiness inside that you have when you meditate is actually so beautiful that uh, you start to realize what a pain it is, all of this thinking all the time, especially the thinking, silly thinking about who you are and all these kind of things. Uh, you let all that go and you just feel peaceful inside. That is a beautiful identity. Even that identity you have to abandon, but it is a far more useful identity to have the ident identify with peace, identify with bliss, identify with emptiness even. Uh, that is much, much more useful then. Uh. And so your existence changes again, yeah? You grasp less onto the ideas of who you are because you, you realize actually this is just limiting it. it limits me as a person you let that go and you start to identify more with the things of meditation your existence changes where your mind inclines changes the baba changes as a consequence of your grasping changing here then there is the uh, the last one of the upadanas the uh, uh, dit upadana these are the upadanas about views, about how we view the world, yeah, and uh, traditionally in Buddhism that is uh, views about uh, eternalism and annihilationism, uh, the idea that when you die you carry on forever in some kind of state, you get unified with Brahma or something like that, uh, or you are annihilated, yeah, you just end, that's kind of the 
Uh, the modern view of things tends to be the idea of annihilation, yeah, but it's been around for millennia. It's, not, it's not a, just as ancient as all of these other views. Uh, and uh, this also becomes often an obsession with us, yeah. Who am I? What am I? What kind of person am I? What what are my views? Yeah, and you think about these things, you obsess about these things, and it relates very often. It relates to our uh, identity and our perception of who we are. This too can become part and parcel of the continued existence uh, and thinking about things. Uh, so uh, that is the upadana. And if you add all of those things together, yeah, your sense of self, uh, the sensory world, the sensory experience in the world, uh, uh, your uh, silas, your uh, observances and precepts, yeah, and our views about things, this can also be, could also expand, expand that if you like to all kinds of views, maybe political views or whatever it might be. Uh, and if you look at it like that, this is starting to be very all encompassing. Yeah, there's very few things outside of this. Uh, we are here dealing with pretty much all the aspects of life. Uh, so you can see here that all of these grass things, uh, yeah, because they concern almost all the aspects of life, uh, it means that your continued existence, uh, uh, what you are inclined towards, uh, where your mind likes to hang out, uh, it is almost completely determined by that grasping. Uh, the grasping becomes the condition for that continued existence. Uh, and then that continued existence, then inclining of the mind, then uh, uh, the condition for how you get reborn as a consequence. So um, anyway, so there, there you are. Yeah. So that is uh, uh, a little bit about that. It's a fascinating topic, uh, how grasping leads to uh, continued existence. But now we need to move on. The question then is, what is the condition for grasping? And uh, many of you will know this straight away. And the answer is da, 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 craving. <laughs> craving is the condition for grasping. Yeah. And uh, the reason for that, uh, first of all, what it is it? Craving is pretty much all the desires that we have in our life. Yeah. And uh, we have lots of desires and desires is almost always present in our mind in one way or another. And we're almost motivated to do things and always motivated to attend to something, directing our actions or our mind towards something. And we're almost, almost always driven in a certain way. And that is the craving right in there. It is really only in deep samadhi that the craving is completely gone. And because we are in the world, because we have these desires to, uh, to, to achieve various things, and then we, to achieve that craving, to satisfy that craving, one of the things that we do is we grasp things, we hold on to things. Yeah, I mentioned before, because we, one of the most important cravings is the craving for sensory pleasures, or craving in the sensory realm. So of course, once you have that craving in the sensory realm, we grasp objects in that sensory realm. As I mentioned before, relationships, uh, a house, a job, a entertainment, or so whatever it is, all of this kind of sphere of things that we do as a consequence of our craving. Uh, the grasping allows us to satisfy the craving. Uh, craving also relates to things like our sense of self, yeah? And because we have the sense of self there, the craving wants to give content to that sense of self. It wants to make us into something. Uh, and then we grasp ideas about ourselves because we crave to be somebody. Yeah? And so we build up this identity inside of us. And uh, you could say that those are perhaps the two most important aspects of craving. Yeah? The idea of uh, enjoying the sensory world and then the sense of identity that we have inside of us. And then all the four grasping that I was talking about, they really uh, emerge from that uh, the views and the sense of self yeah, uh, come from this idea of wanting to solidify who we are and, and the uh, 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 taking up of, of um, precepts and observance. Yeah, well, that is also part of this craving. It is a way of expressing ourselves, of actually acquiring happiness in the world. It's a slightly different way of acquiring happiness uh, 
but it is really part of the same thing, you know, satisfying craving ultimately. That's why we become interested in the Dhamma, that's why we become Buddhist. Yeah? Craving is what drives us to Buddhism. If we didn't have any desire for happiness or whatever, we'd never choose the Dhamma, we'd never choose any kind of spiritual practice at all. And so all of that is driven by that. That is also part of the Sila Vata, if you like. Yeah? So craving drives the taking up of things. Yeah? That kind of hopefully that makes sense. Um, but uh, let us just carry on a little bit because time is going fast as usual. So, what is the condition for craving? Is the next one, and not very surprising, the condition for craving is feeling. Yeah, uh, if because we feel the world, because that is part and parcel of what we are, we are feeling beings, and because we feel well. Well, that feeling must lead to craving. Yeah? And it must lead to craving because our feelings are unstable. Sometimes we are unhappy, sometimes we are happy, sometimes often we are kind of neutral. Yeah? But because by their definition, we want the happy feeling. That's why they're called happy feelings, because they are good. Because by definition, we want that. Craving must always arise as a consequence of feelings. So when you have feelings, then cravings have come as a consequence of that. Yeah. And um, feelings is fascinating. Yeah? Feeling here, what we mean is we mean whether an experience is good, bad, or neutral. We don't mean emotions or anything like that, yeah? whether something is good, bad, or neutral. So, uh, what are feelings? And uh, this comes back to this very idea of Buddhism being about the very meaning of life. Yeah? Feelings is what gives value to things in the world. A feeling is what actually is the motivating factor in almost everything we do. Things have value because of feelings. If there were no feelings, yeah, if you were completely neutral all the time, you would never be able to choose anything. Nothing would have any value for you. If you looked at a beautiful, uh, you know, something, a beautiful scene, or you looked at the most ugly, uh, toxic waste dump, and you compare the two, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference because it wouldn't give rise to a feeling inside of you. So feeling is that which gives value to everything in our life. Feeling is so, it's a kind of critical junction point, yeah, where kind of where uh, uh, our entire life kind of plays out because of feeling, yeah. So very critical factor, uh, yeah, right there in the middle of the position. So because uh, this is what value life. This is what life is all about. Without feeling, there wouldn't be anything. Everything would be completely pointless and aimless and meaningless. And, uh, of course, that then becomes a very critical factor in dependent origination. And of course, our life is going to revolve around. It's going to revolve. Life always revolves around things that are meaningful for us. Yeah, things that are that uh, actually are are of value. And because feeling is what gives life value. That then must become the driving force, uh, which uh, is a condition for everything else. And we crave as a consequence. We are motivated as a consequence of feeling. Yeah? Yeah? So feeling is sometimes, I think, underestimated. It is actually, um, in some ways, in, from one particular way of looking at it, it is perhaps the most important of the five kanas, uh, because it is what drives us in everything in our existence. Uh, so feeling conditions craving, yeah. So you crave the good, feelings, you anti-crave the bad feelings, and you reject the uh, bad feelings. Yeah. So there's a craving coming from two different sides: uh, the rejection, the like, and the dislike. Yeah. The uh, aversion and the attraction towards them. That comes the two sides of craving. Yeah? So because we feel, we crave. Them. So fairly obvious, I suppose. But uh, I think often. People don't really fully grasp the profundity of feeling that it actually this is really the linchpin in a sense of existence uh, that really gives existence meaning in one way or another. Why, where does feeling come from? Uh, and feeling comes from this thing we call contact. Uh, I should not forget my slides. Uh, contact is the condition for feeling. Yeah. So contact here, what does it mean? Well, it means every time we experience something that is contact. Yeah, we, it's like we contact the world, the world outside, 
and makes contact with our mind through the sense organs. Yeah. So this is how there is contact. There is this merger of an external world and an inner world. Yeah? Now, contact is quite interesting because contact in the suttas, there's two aspects to that contact. And um, I should be mindful of the time here. Uh, the two aspects of the contact is that uh, what is called the uh, impingement contact, whereby an external object kind of comes to the sense. Yeah, you see something. And so it has to, the eye has to be there. If the eye isn't there, you will never see anything. So it has to hit the eye, so to speak. And yeah, this is just like a metaphor, I'm not sure that is exactly what happens, but uh, it gives an idea. But then after it hits the eye, it also has to be processed by the mind. The mind has to actually deal with that input and make something of it. Yeah. So you have to kind of, uh, it's not just input, but you actually see things. Yeah, there are things out there. The mind works on it. It says if it's good or bad. And this is how the feelings arise from all of these kind of things. So, so from that contact, uh, the feelings then arise. And because contact is twofold, because it is both the physical contact on the body and also the mind working on it, uh, it means that we are not just passive receivers of the world around us. Uh, yeah, how we deal with the world around us depends on how that mind receives the input coming from the outside. So uh, if we develop our mind in the right way, the world starts to look different. Uh, if we develop our mind in the wrong way, it also starts to look different, but in a negative sense. Uh, yeah? So, uh, and for that reason, the feelings start to change as well then. So it is kind of strange, but what it actually means is that if we develop in a positive way, we feel better. The world starts to look nicer, yeah, because we deal with the contact in a different way. Yeah? We see the beauty around us more readily. Yeah? So merely by changing our mental attitude, by developing our mind, the world also changes with that. Yeah? We feel the world in a new way. Yeah? That's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah? Kind of nice. Because it means that we are not just passive recipients of all this junk coming into us, uh, but it's actually up to us to make sure that we deal with all this stuff of the world in the right way. And then actually things start to become better as a consequence. Uh, the twofold aspect of contact. Uh, where does contact come from? It comes from the six sense fields. Uh, yeah, the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body and the mind. And so uh, the sixth sense field means that there is like uh, the eye and then there is forms outside. When they come into contact, uh, yeah, when they kind of um, meet because you are attending to something, attention is one of the factors here as well, that is when contact happens. Contact is the kind of coming together of those three. Yeah? So once there is contact coming together of the three, uh, uh, then feelings arise as a consequence, depending on how you deal with that input from the outsider. So uh, if we are going to uh, avoid contact altogether, because we can now start to see here that, you know, if this sequence goes on, yeah, you're kind of moving on, contact, feeling, craving, etc. The way then to end that whole sequence uh, you have to end the six sense fields. Yeah, that's really the only way to do it. So this kind of starts to give you an idea of the moving towards the root of the problem right here, uh, the six sense fields. Um, uh, so this is the, uh, the, the, the six sense field. Let me take one more, more back before we, before we stop. Uh, what then is the condition for the six sense fields? Uh, and uh, this is one of those very cryptic formulas, independent origination, that name and form are the conditions for the six sense fields. Uh, yeah? And uh, here we are. Uh, what this means basically is just that uh, um, name and form, they are just two aspects, if you like, of our existence. Yeah? Name is the way we mentally deal with the world a very important part of how we deal with the world is naming things yeah recognition or perception is really a kind of naming when you see something and you recognize it well it's almost like you name it yeah you see a brick okay you don't may not say the word but the basic idea of naming is there assumed under uh, kind of underneath that 
And then there is the form. The form is just the physical aspect of the world. Yeah, the, the raw physical aspect uh, and then the naming of that. Uh, and the, the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why the Buddha divides these things up in this particular way uh, is because that um, uh, precisely what I said before, when we contact the world, uh, we contact the world both physically and also mentally. Yeah? And that is why the Buddha he divides up uh, uh, Nama Rupa, form, name and form, because one is the mental aspect, one is the physical aspect. It's what allows you to receive something through the eyes, and the other one is the mind working on it. That's the Nama aspect uh, when you name these particular things. So. So that becomes the background, yeah? This is the kind of the behind, if you like, the uh, six senses is the entire uh, mental and physical apparatus, if you like, of a human being, which allows the six, six sense fields to, 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 to exist, which then makes contact possible in this way. And then from the contact uh, comes the feeling, yeah? So, uh, I, uh, I feel really bad about this. I'm really behind, behind with what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to have finished this already, but uh, we cannot, there's no way we're gonna finish it. So we are just going to have to stop feeling bad about what we can't control. <laughs> and we're going to have to do some meditation instead. I think this is a good point to do some meditation actually. So, um, great. So uh, I will just, um, go out of the sharing mode, yeah, and uh, now get ready and let's do some meditation together. Okay, everyone. So after all of that uh, the dependent origination theory, it's good to have a bit of a break and just relax a little bit uh, and maybe allow some of these uh, powerful ideas to, just to sink in a little bit. Uh, but just allow them to sink in at the back of your mind and don't think about them during the meditation practice uh, because otherwise you just uh, disturb yourself. Then you are heading for rebirth in the dependent origination uh, world of ideas or something like that. So let it all go and let it all be and then we'll come back to this later on. Now is the time to enjoy and to relax and just to have a good time uh, and rest the mind for a short, short period of time. Uh.
and uh, as you do this, uh, you can, if you like, imagine yourself uh, being on your deathbed. And one of the great things about being on the deathbed uh, is that there is nothing in this world that is really interesting anymore. Huh? All you are doing is just lying back and relaxing. Yeah? You don't have to force yourself to let go. The letting go is automatic yeah? because you know that you have come to the end of your life. Uh, you're just peaceful automatically without having really to pressure yourself or push yourself in one way or the other one. Yeah? So imagine yourself on your deathbed, yeah? peace fully lying back in and just letting go automatically because you know that there's nothing in this world that, that you can ever hold on to. Huh? It's such a marvelous thing to die, uh, such a marvelous thing to 
let go of everything in this world and, and just experience that emptiness that remains, that, that beautiful emptiness which is filled with a kind of kindness and gentleness and, and a lack, a complete lack of disturbance. So, so bring that emptiness out, allow that emptiness to grow inside of you that as you just gradually let go of everything in this world, that there's nothing in this world that you can hold on to, nor is it worthy of being held on to.
Okay, everyone, that's it for now, and we'll see you back again in a couple of hours. Right?